Welcome to Superhero Rundown. I'm Blofeld, and today we're going to be looking at a British franchise that's been running since the 1960s. No, not him, the other one. Yeah. Him. As those of you who watched my old show know, I am quite the Bond fanatic. Mostly because of the camp and one-liners. I am a sucker for terrible one-liners. The hot Bond girls don't hurt his case either. This is going to probably be a longer episode than normal, if for no other reason than I have the greatest need to prove that James Bond is a superhero. But before we can get to the amazingness that is the Eon film franchise, we need to talk about the books first. Ian Fleming wanted to write the spy story to end all spy stories, and he succeeded for sure with James Bond. Having started writing in January 1952, he published 14 books, the final two posthumously. And Bond didn't stop there. Some authors still publish Bond stories today. Fleming didn't have any outlines, he just made up the Bond stories as he went along, based largely on his love of the spy genre, as well as his own work in British naval intelligence. M, in case you were wondering, is what Ian Fleming called his mother. M is also James Bond's boss. Of course I know that. You do see what I mean, right? So why do these books exist? Well, aside from not being able to go into the field because he knew too much, Fleming existed in a fascinating time. Britain was still an imperial power in the 1950s, and they were still dealing with the effects of World War II. But it was also a commentary on Anglo-American relations, specifically with the relationship between Felix Leiter and James Bond. Bond also solved some of America's issues in Goldfinger, License to Kill, Live and Let Die, A View to a Kill, and Dr. No, as well as a few others like Tomorrow Never Dies, Moonraker, and Diamonds Are Forever. We only know so far the plot of No Time to Die involves Mr. Bond and Mr. Leiter rescuing a rogue scientist and somehow I'm involved. We won't know, of course, for a couple of days, so... Shh. Fleming got to see the first two Bonds with Sean Connery before he died in 1964, but after his death, the franchise got a bit more into left field with their adaptations. The first three, Dr. No from Russia with Love and Goldfinger, are the closest in adaptation to their books. The hilarious thing is the films take elements from the books, and sometimes it gets a bit weird. For example... Have a look at this. Uh, let me take your coat. Arms of Sir Thomas Bond, Baronet of Peckham, died 1734. Argent on a chevron sable. Three best the world is not enough is on his family's coat of arms. And then... I could have given you the world. Oh. The world is not enough. Foolish sentiment. Family motto. That's in the book. You took the most insignificant part of a book and made it have a thread. All right. I'm mildly impressed. Now I know what you're thinking. Crimson, what the hell does this even have to do with anything? I thought you were saying he's a superhero. Prove it. Okay, Hotshot, let me explain to you who James Bond is, because everyone knows his goddamn name. 007, his status in MI6, gives him a license to kill. We know when he's on a mission, he just has sheer luck of not getting shot and running into the right person slash weapon slash location, or saying the right thing at the right time. Yes, I am fully convinced that this man's superpowers are his sheer dumb luck. For example... Never heard of evil can evil. I mean, what kind of super agent can do that? My own henchman can't even do that. I'm mildly disappointed in my henchman for not being able to do that. But he's kind of the worst. A heavy drinker, misogynistic. Don't forget my pathetic love of country. <laughs> because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War. He doesn't always save the girl, and he hates making mistakes. The fact that this series of films has endured for almost 60 years is a testament to how well people can identify with any of the actors to play Bond when they bring something different to the table, and that's what makes this franchise so interesting. Sort of like Captain Kirk, if Captain Kirk was British and went around killing things that were 
threatening. Look, there's a lot to unpack here. His sheer dumb luck superpowers, the things that are the same in every film, like my inevitable defeat apparently, and his place in the world of geopolitics, which, to be fair, I do not think he knows how to spell geopolitics, but he's involved in them somehow. This is a nightmare. First, we're going to look at the tropes. A trope is a reoccurring element in a work of fiction, though that's the simplest definition. So let's start with the gun barrel sequence as it appears in every canonical Eon film in some way or form. The image is supposedly from the dumbass assassin's point of view as he trains his gun on Bond and utterly fails at killing him when Bond turns, shoots the bastard, and blood pours down the screen to start or end the film. Most films begin with this, with the exception of Casino Royale, where it's actually involved in the plot, and Quantum of Solace, as well as Skyfall, where they are placed at the end of the film. Because Daniel Craig is a special snowflake assassin bond or something. And by snowflake, I mean badass. Although, there are some questionable things about his representation. So after the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963, Bond came along and he is hypersexualized by both men and women. He can be construed as a bisexual icon. Don't believe me. Well, first time for everything, I guess. Hmm. What makes you think this is my first time? Usually with hypersexualization, it's associated with the Hollywood bombshells. Rita Hayworth, Marilyn Monroe, Mae West, Audrey Hepburn, Grace Kelly, Marlena Dietrich, and many more women. My point is that men are not as sexualized as the Hollywood bombshells. You have like Douglas Fairbanks, Errol Flynn, Marlon Brando and the like, but they aren't sexualized to the degree that women are. At least until James Bond entered the scene. He's supposed to be able to melt your heart. You want him, need him, and be willing to do anything for him. You know, if you're not the villain, but you're the Bond girl. I will say, though, good on Eon for toning down the misogyny and the racism. Okay, so in the books, there's phrases like sweet tang of rape. Not joking. But Eon took that out, and while Bond is still somewhat misogynistic and racist, it isn't as bad as it could be. Not saying that to excuse it, just pointing out that the filmmakers knew what material they were working with. Where was I? Oh yes, the tropes of the superhero and his sheer dumb luck. So in a superhero film, usually the following happens as long as it isn't an origin story. Bad guy does something bad, superhero finds out, they investigate, then they find the villain, usually the villain tricks them into thinking it's not what it seems, then superhero finds out that the villain lied and fights the henchman, big fight with the villain, get significant other, credits. James Bond's progression is as thusly. Something bad happens, MI6 finds out, Bond gets called in, he flirts with Money Penny, then he gets his gadgets from Q, investigates the bad guy, fights the henchman, gets captured, kills the villain, then sleeps with the Bond girl, credits. Obviously a superhero, the only difference is, is that Q Branch, and of course I know about Q Branch, provides him with gadgets, and he escapes situations with his sheer dumb luck. For example, do you remember when Goldfinger had him tied up under a laser, and then he escaped? Goldfinger was a buffoon. I did rather like Oddjob, though. His hat was glorious. Of the people constantly in Bond's life, there are three. M, Moneypenny, and Q. All three have a role to play. M is his boss, Moneypenny is M's secretary, and Q gives Bond what he needs for his missions. Most of these three characters appear consistently throughout the franchise, and all of them scold him in one form or another. Q is probably the most important of the three because he's essentially the Lucius Fox of the Bond universe, designs and makes gadgets that we associate with Bond from simple things to the more complex, then back to the simple. Q Branch always has something to test on Bond, and more often than not, it saves his life. 
Then we have the car. From Bentley, Lotus, Renault, and BMW, the iconic Aston Martin appeared first in Goldfinger. And from that point on, it became the Bond car. Craig's Bond still uses it. And the car sold a lot more because dudes bought it, even though it wasn't outfitted by Q Branch. What gets me about James Bond, though, is the fact that he is just able to defy the laws of physics. <laughs> Like, even with the jetpack on the boat, you can't cover that much land on one jump. And don't forget these gems! Oh, and let's not forget about the explosions. There are so many! entertainment, but if the fact that he has just rolled so many nat 20s to avoid death doesn't convince you of his superherodom, I don't know what will. Look at this. You missed Mr. Bond. Did I? not dead yet. The quintessential thing that makes Bond, in addition to the dumb luck defying of physics and Q's gadgets, is the Bond girl. The Bond girl is supposed to be alluring, unforgettable, and attracted to the dashing James Bond. And may I just say, Miss Galore was done dirty in Goldfinger, if you ask me. But the Bond girl is more than that. They can be helpful allies, villains, passive participants, enemy agents, or even just cross his path once, sleep with him, and we might see them again or we might not. Also, the names are just... sexual. There's no other way to describe it. Pussy Galore, Chew Me, Xena on a Top, Plenty of Tool, Mary Goodnight, Holly Goodhead, Dr. Christmas Jones, Honey Rider, the list goes on. But that doesn't excuse his misogyny. Even when he married Tracy, it didn't excuse it. He slapped Tracy in the movie, and yes, he mourns her in the films, but that doesn't excuse how many people he's killed, including Bond girls. The fan theories on the continuity in Bond range from the title of 007 being passed down to different guys, to the same guy but he just happens to be a Time Lord, to it's not the same guy, but they're all named James Bond. Look, every fandom has its theories. I just enjoy the movies. <sighs> Don't even get me started on the yellow face and you only live twice and the white face and die another day. It's a travesty. The last thing that is important in the tropes of James Bond is the villain. Sometimes they are megalomaniacs, freelance assassins, false allies, MI6 turncoats, moguls, just straight up evil, or villainesses. But they are always larger than life and a social commentary on the world at large, cementing Bond's place in geopolitics. I don't want to talk about Spectre. What is the other? I'm a member of Spectre. Spectre? Spectre. Special executive for counterintelligence, terrorism, revenge, extortion. No, the other one. Fuck that movie, I hate it. The henchmen are also important because not only do they help out the villain, they also provide the middle act obstacles for our superhero. Every henchman in James Bond is terrible, unless they have a special skill or weapon or are named. So remember how I talked about the formula for James Bond as compared to superheroes? Here's the nitty gritty. The villain will meet our hero face to face with a menacing henchman of some kind. Then Bond gets captured and the villain monologues and leaves Bond to die. 
Unless they aren't a dumbass. Bond escapes, fights, and kills the henchmen, or the henchmen agree to no longer interfere. Then Bond finds the villain, and they fight. Usually, if Bond does kill the villain, it's either ridiculous or in an actually plausible way. And if the Bond girl is in the middle of all of it, Bond rescues her and sleeps with her, of course. I don't understand how anyone could not call him a superhero at this point. But feel free to put those in the comments that I won't be reading, because I have an evil organization to run and I'm only here for one episode. In addition to the high action and intrigue, sometimes the movies are good enough to represent the real issues we face in the world. Part of his appeal is that he's sort of a pseudo-detective. But it's more of a curiosity gets the cat in danger, but then he rolls 20 is what it's needed most so he can escape. And honestly, that's part of the appeal. We want our superheroes to escape in the nick of time. It adds thrill to the action as I try to kill him. Part of the reason I adore James Bond, which again, for the record, I am not okay with the blatant sexism and misogyny, but... It is usually on the cutting edge of technology and cinematic accomplishment. The stunts are mind-blowing, and mainstream audiences have seen things in the Bond films that they haven't seen before. Like the flipping car, a stunt that had never been done before. A world first thanks to James Bond. What I'm saying is, the Fast and the Furious franchise? Without the flipping car in Man with the Golden Gun... That franchise never would have gotten off the ground. You're welcome, Vin Diesel. Okay, so what about the geopolitical aspect of James Bond? Probably the most hilarious thing is that the film franchise enjoys worldwide popularity and it celebrates the pursuit of a white male British agent. He combats and defeats evil challenges to the Western democratic order as well as the free market. Because capitalism. According to O. James, 007 as International Man of History, the Bond films and the novels have an interesting relationship. The Bond films and the Ian Fleming novels, which were the source of the character and some of the plots, thus offer us an opportunity to see how perceptions of that special relationship have changed over the years, from both the British perspective, mostly in Fleming's novels, and the American one, mostly in the films. As such perceptions go, one might think that, through the thick and thin of it all, it was James Bond, and by association Britain, who saved America. The truth, however, is that it was America that saved Bond. Launched into the world in Fleming's 1953 novel Casino Royale, Bond was a quintessentially British figure, and as such might have remained a character known only within the genre of spy fiction. But he was translated into a kind of Anglo-American hybrid for the film role, and it is the film rather than the literary Bond that is most familiar to millions around the world. Yeah, it's true. The films are both English and American funded, so without either, it would be a different beast. But in particular, Daniel Craig has become the 21st century James Bond, with his films focusing on Big Brother, defending the homeland, and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with megalomaniacs working for organizations like Quantum and Spectre. In I've Been Inspecting You, Mr. Bond, the author explains, Casino Royale pivots around the notion of becoming Bond, laying bare the psychological scars incurred in the ascension to the status of popular cultural archetype. Bond is seen attaining double O status along with many of the stereotypes surrounding it, such as a taste for shaken, not stirred vodka martinis. He also suffers the heartbreak that impels him to become an inveterate heartbreaker in turn, Vesper also paves the way for Skyfall's interest in the idea of before Bond when she perceptively, if cruelly, fingers the prior personal trauma, being orphaned, that propelled him into MI6's preferred recruitment constituency. Maladjusted young men that give little thought to sacrificing others in order to protect Queen and Country. Meanwhile, the real money shot of Skyfall's opening title sequence titillates not with the traditional promise of girls, guns, and or foreign travel, but with the prospect of getting right inside 007's head. In the perfect visual equivalent of a money-back guarantee, the image in question fades to black via a zoom into, and by implication through, Daniel Craig's right iris. By the time Spectre is reached, a sense of permanent and possibly irretrievable national crisis is firmly entrenched. 
M rails against the disastrous consequences of an imminent merger between MI5 and MI6, the biggest shakeup in the history of British intelligence. And Craig has spent more time in the United Kingdom than any other Bond. I will say, though, even if I hate it, Spectre does entrench Craig's Bond into an arc that was started in Casino Royale. Le Chivre, Green, and Silva all lead to Blofeld. Blofeld. Me, Blofeld, as James Bond's brother, is utterly ridiculous and stupid. Die mad about it. No, really, die mad about it. Over there in my shock tank. This is the dumbest plot twist in the history of the James Bond franchise, and that motherfucker's been to space! The old MI6 is blown to smithereens, and Mallory becomes the new M after the death of Judy Dench's M. Why does it matter? Because it firmly puts faith in the British state. You know, even though Brexit's a thing. Speaking of Blofeld, have you ever noticed the pattern? In The Spy Who Loved Globalization, the author explains, Each story consists of several fundamental predictable elements. The antagonist is a sovereignty-free actor, either a person or an organization that threatens the welfare and security of a society or perhaps the entire world. This sovereignty-free actor thrives within the folds of the sovereign state system, which are areas of activity that states are unable or unwilling to regulate, such as international organized crime, arms trade, terrorism, or international commerce. To combat a challenge to their authority and protect and provide for the common welfare, state officials must put aside their disagreements and cooperate. And that includes Bond. Some of the earlier films show him going toe-to-toe -to -toe with M. Ooh, naughty. You have an assignment, and I expect you to carry it out objectively and professionally. Then you have my resignation, sir. We're not a country club, 007. I will say that Ian Fleming did do good as he developed this globalization insight before others even started analyzing the consequences. Whereas international relations theorists of the 1960s and 1970s focused on superpower security struggles and international regimes, Fleming recognized an evolving second world of politics populated by authorities free from the domestic and international constraints and responsibilities of governments. Much like in Bond stories, the clash between the world and the world of sovereign states has produced integrative and fragmenting dynamics that some contemporary international affairs theorists have labeled globalization, chaos, and fragmentation. If Bond films have taught us one thing, it is that popular awareness of globalization and its attendant tensions and paradoxes predates by decades serious scholarly treatment of the subject. And that means, like any superhero franchise, Mr. Bond is a running commentary on what we face in the world today. Actually, if you think about it, he's really just a sexy Captain Britain. Mm. How's this? Spectre is the stand-in for the USSR because the Cold War was a thing and they couldn't just say, yeah, it's the USSR, but like, it's fine. Now in the post 9-11 world, and I swear it still freaks me out that there are people who weren't alive for that, Quantum, Rogue State. Terrorist non-state actors? Silva. It's all there. In geopolitics, gender, and genre, we find that in the post-Cold War and post-9-11 eras, with terrorism, weakened failing states, and economic dislocation at the forefront of analysts' minds, Bond may be even more relevant than when he was first written in the 1950s and first filmically depicted in the 1960s. In this world where non-state actors are supported by hidden international networks and are feared more than traditional state actors, where knowledge and skill are seen as perhaps even more critical than raw firepower to international security, spies such as Bond remain the chief means to defeat the shadowy threats faced by the West. Okay, so you're thinking, cool, but what's the point? My point is that James Bond is the only superhero that takes on global threats in the context of the real world through allegory. It's why Spectre was a stand-in, and villains like Le Chifre and Silva are entities that work on their own as allegories for international terrorists and hackers. And I know what you're thinking, but the title sequence at least tells us what the movie's about. That's true, but it goes deeper than that. Politically, it echoes studies in contemporary international insecurity, particularly the human security literature, pointing to linkages between terrorist activity and legitimate business and state interests. 
articulating new security threats such as water shortages and continuing concerns about oil shortages and suggesting tension between the haves and have-nots in terms of financial, military, and natural resources while reinforcing old Bondian notions about the Eastern Bloc and Russia. The title sequence sets up the political game on the international stage, and if Bond is to succeed in defending Britain in the West, he's going to have to go through me. Okay. Let's talk about Casino Royale, mostly because it's not the worst Bond film and is one of the better ones from the Craig era. The title sequence sets up the game, specifically... The sequence is dominated by floating images of roulette wheels and cards that become ammunition for guns and that pierce graphic images of men. Unlike other Bond title sequences that privilege women's bodies as sex objects, threats, or victims of violence, Casino Royale's title sequence is populated almost exclusively by male images. We get only a glimpse of Vesper's face superimposed on the Queen of Hearts playing card. The erasure of the female form has the effect of extending the already hyper-masculinized diegetic world of Bond because it reinforces the notion that international security is the purview of men. Men are both the chief threats to the global capitalist system and its chief protectors and defenders. Which is super sexist and on par for James Bond, but it does go further than the title sequence. In the now famous scene where Bond is tortured by Le Chiffre, the specularization of Daniel Craig's desirable naked body is tempered by the gruesome reality of the possibility of genital disfigurement, sterilization, and even death. In classic voyeuristic manner, the viewer is both attracted to and repulsed by the image on the screen. This attraction-repulsion dynamic parallels responses to contemporary British, European, or Western security threats wherein citizens are simultaneously obsessed with and traumatized by global terror and the possibility of torture by terrorists. In true Bondian fashion, the national anxiety is overcome because Bond's body is able to withstand, for Britain and the world order, any kind of attack. Of course, at the same time that this focus on the body of Bond reinforces the ability of the West to repel terrorism and other threats, it has the effect of reinscribing traditional gender order wherein men, specifically Bond, are the masters of international politics. Hypermasculinization is no stranger to Mr. Bond, but we've never seen it on a scale like this before. When James Bond was tortured in The World Is Not Enough, he was clothed for it. But Daniel Craig seems to not be a fan of clothing. And if I had known that in 1964, well... Casino Royale is really the first film that made the context of the modern superhero franchise. In Casino Royale and franchise remix, James Bond is Superhero, the author argues. In remixing the James Bond franchise, Casino Royale argues for its place within the superhero genre. Much that is new about Bond and Casino Royale aligns him with superheroes like Spider-Man and Iron Man, especially as they appear in the first films of their modern iteration. The first film of a franchise remix focuses on the origin story of the superhero. And like Spider-Man or Iron Man, Casino Royale propels James Bond to his super identity as James Bond. Now let's look at this from a superhero perspective. Before the title sequence, we see his origin story. How he becomes the double O with a license to kill. Then we see the movie Make the Argument. Bond's moment of conversion in Casino Royale comes when Demetrios connects Bond to Le Chiffre's plot to destroy the airliner. The new 00 agent injects himself into an extraordinary world of adventure. In Act 2, in Act 2, superheroes struggle with the obstacles and conflicts of establishing themselves in a new identity. The ordinary side of the identity struggles with becoming the superhero. Bond makes many mistakes upon entering Le Chiffre's world. Solange, Demetrios' wife, dies because of Bond. Bond loses all of the money from Vesper's bank. Act 2 ends when the nemesis appears for a final showdown. Spider-Man vs. Green Goblin, Batman vs. Raja Ghoul, providing the trial by fire from which emerges the superhero. Vesper's deal with Mr. White's organization sets up the showdown at the end of Casino Royale. A denouement follows and reaffirms that the ordinary identity has become super. I am Spider-Man, or Batman answering the bat signal, and Bond declares himself on a narrative level and many other levels of being. Casino Royale follows a superhero narrative model, specifically an origin story. 
And like other films of this genre in the current decade remixes a new, usually darker vision of the superhero. So yes, there are explosions in CGI, but the performance of Craig moves him away from his predecessors and their part of the machine MI6 status quo. The most important thing to take from Casino Royale though, Craig doesn't become James Bond as a superhero until the last act of the film, much like Iron Man at the end of Iron Man 1. And for most of the film, James Bond is finding his footing as a British superhero in a new world, the modern world. Casino Royale acknowledges intertextual references, yet never relies on parody. Casino Royale, like Batman Begins, also mixes in a darker take on the hero than previously seen in the feature films, and suggests maturity through impressions of the hero's psychological instability. Bond begins as a motionless assassin and recovers a sense of self with Vesper, but then is damaged by what seems a betrayal. An M is important in Casino Royale and the subsequent Bond films as well. M reveals an almost complete inversion of Fleming's sexism. A woman superior corrects the male's attitude about his emotional reaction, blinding him to the truth of the situation. Bond's maturity, more accurately the maturity of the franchise, accepts women as figures of authority. This new Bond does not defend the status quo and has a very tenuous relationship with the power structure he represents. MI6 is there, but this is more about M's relationship with Bond than with the British government. It's why in Skyfall there's such a great emotional payoff. Casino Royale, like most of its predecessors, flashes an array of aspirational products. Expensive watches, clothes, cars, yet most of the products act within the narrative as objects Bond needs to pretend to be someone other than himself, whereas in the previous films the product placement was crucial to Bond being able to perform his job. When Q appears in a Bond film, he attaches machinery to Bond, emphasizing the metaphorical machine of which he was an integral part. As the modern iteration of Bond moves away from an elite hero, Bond becomes even more like a movie superhero. Bond's superhero costume becomes the tuxedo. Vesper supplies one, he does not have his own. The tuxedo personifies, to paraphrase from Batman Begins, a symbol people can understand. Speaking of Vesper, let's talk about Bond girl villains. In The Coldest Weapon, the Bond girl villain in James Bond films, the author explains, by enabling Bond's mission, the seduction of women performs a narrative function that not only drives the plot, but also reinforces the expected conventions of a Bond film and asserts Bond's role as an action hero. A character who lacks discernible change and who is typically a flat character. A character who is only ever faced with one type of situation and could only respond to any situation in the same predictable way. Through usually violent action. And yeah, romantic attachment is important to the films because erotic thriller. The Bond girl villain and her relationship with Bond do not rely on a set of absolute interactions. Unlike the main villain, the Bond girl, or even Bond's allies, her presence is not assured. In her long history, she sometimes is completely absent, sometimes overshadows the Bond girl and the villain, and sometimes has a relatively minor role. Amid formulaic expectations for Bond films as erotic thrillers, her ability to deviate from the expected criteria of a Bond film establishes her as an ideologically contested site and index for the changing ideological structure of Bond and the Bond films. She defines masculine perceptions of Bond in the early films with specific reference to film noir stereotypes, is replaced by a changed emphasis on Bond girls in the 1970s and 1980s, and resurfaces in the Pierce Brosnan films to emphasize changed roles for women and Bond's greater emotional vulnerability. Obviously, the death of his wife Tracy left a profound impact on James Bond. I know because I killed her. But with Mr. Craig rebooting the franchise, as it were, one has to wonder who's going to replace Dame Diana Regis Tracy so that I can kill her again and make sure she only lives twice. Bond has killed three women in 23 movies, two in the Brosnan films, so you know, that's a thing. As the franchise progresses into the late 1980s, and Timothy Dalton's Bond endorsing and perpetuating monogamous relationships becomes the focus of the film, Dalton's Bond neglects short-term relationships in favor of his mission, 
but he will jeopardize the mission and even renounce M in the Secret Service for a monogamous relationship. The emphasis on monogamy diminishes the tension between Bond and the Bond girl, reduces her status as an ambiguous representative, and makes the Bond girl villain further irrelevant. Now, I've heard a lot about this gay James Bond thing, and if I may be clear, it's quite obvious that James Bond is either bisexual or pansexual, because he slept with hundreds of women and several men. Each cinematic Bond incarnation, from Sean Connery through Roger Moore and up to Daniel Craig, embodies and perhaps even influences the changing values of his times as he moves through exotic locations, seduces women, makes use of the latest improbable technologies, and relies on uncomfortable racial stereotypes. Which the author of James Bond, From Racial Stereotypes to a Queer and a Woke 007, tells us. And this can be traced back to pre-Daniel Craig Bond 2, specifically with the McCarthy witch hunts and the Don't Ask, Don't Tell military policy in the United States. In gender and sexuality politics in the James Bond film series, we are told that the longevity of the James Bond series and its centralization of gender and sexuality make it an excellent site through which to explore long-term cultural shifts in popular understanding, particularly as regards sexual activity and service to the state. Some scholars have cautioned that popular culture has not always been out in front as regards recasting traditional identities or promoting progressive political change, in part because it reflects mainstream production and cultural values. There is, of course, no doubt that traditional understandings that reinforce regressive gender and sex roles appear throughout the Bond series. It's part of the reason why Jeffrey Wright is the new Felix Leiter. People have come around on inclusion of people of color, too. But let's talk about queer theory. What does that mean for James Bond? Well, in the first or traditional period, Bond exhibits a very traditional form of aggressive masculinity, which is paired with a relatively passive form of femininity in a largely unquestioned manner. The subject of homosexuality, when it arrives at all, is addressed obliquely. Males who are clearly masculine dismiss it as laughable, while less masculine males are represented as clear threats to the survival of the state and are killed. Lesbians who exhibit traditional feminine traits are easily converted back to heterosexuality by Bond's charms, but masculine lesbians are represented as a threat to the state and accordingly slain. During the second or transitional period, traditional masculinity begins to be challenged and a more aggressive form of femininity emerges. For example, Bond's supervisor, known as M, begins to be played by a woman, Judy Dench, who makes her displeasure with Bond's dalliances quite clear and he begins, ever so slightly, to begin to offer a new and somewhat less sexually aggressive form of masculinity the representation of homosexuality also begins to shift, as it begins to be publicly acknowledged, if somewhat obliquely. The bond of the third or contemporary period points toward a new framing of gender and sexuality that highlights a growing vulnerability in masculinity. Feminine characters are often in a position of equal or superior power to bond institutionally as well as interpersonally, making sex frequently as dangerous as work. While the suggestion of homosexuality was once either depicted as threatening to the state, laughable to a highly masculine hero, or carefully concealed, now it is accepted on screen by that remarkable specimen of male masculinity. James Bond, who openly suggests that it is possible that he may have had same-sex sex. Yes, James Bond is progressive to an extent. He's still a misogynist and a sexist and you know, the worst, but he does have some progress with the queer agenda. Well, first time for everything, I guess. What makes you think this is my first time? Bond's new arch enemy, Raoul Silva, has tied Bond to a chair for interrogation which would call to many viewers' minds the quite memorable torture scene in Casino Royale. While berating Bond for his loyalty to M, Silva unbuttons Bond's shirt, strokes his chest, neck, cheek, and inner thighs, and says there's a first time for everything. Bond, rather than laughing off, 
or ignoring the suggestion of same-sex sexuality, quickly retorts, what makes you think this is my first time? His refusal to be intimidated by the suggestion of same-sex sex and his self-depiction as a potentially willing participant afford him a modicum of power and allow him to destabilize Silva, at least momentarily. And it works. It's believable, not just because Daniel Craig and Javier Bardiam sell it, but because James Bond has evolved. He's not as stiff in his politics or his orientation. I will leave you with this quote from Drone Masculinity, James Bond and the Cultural Discourse of Covert Action. Zhukov, writing in Bravda, described the Bondian view of espionage as a world where they write laws with the butt of a pistol, where violence and outrage against female honor is looked on as prowess and murder like an amusing game. An apt assessment of the effect drone masculinity has had on an espionage mindset already primed to think of human life strategically. Zhukov was also the first to connect Bond's influence on public perceptions of military service. The idolization of the killer Bond in a world where the use of napalm substitutes for persuasion and bombs drown out the voice of conscience is to some extent natural. A good number of Fleming's fans have cursed James Bond as they choked in blood on the ground in South Vietnam. So the next time we talk about James Bond, and there will be a next time, we'll talk about how he fits into the concept of the Cold War. And I know all about things that are cold. Just like ice on Mr. Bond's nipples. <laughs> <laughs>